invite all of you to the third of our new speaker series event we call the Stetson Success Speaker Series. Is that enough essence for everyone in the room? And the reason we call it Stetson Success is we are featuring graduates of our MBA program. So the first four speakers are all from our executive MBA program. We call that our EMBA program. You may have seen the acronym on the website or in the advertisement and may not have known what that uh, indicated. But these are individuals who had a significant amount of career experience before they came back to get their MBA. And uh, we'd like to showcase them, not only in terms of their acumen, but also in terms of their promotions and their successes since they've left Stetson. And we also hope that this will be inspirational to all of you in the audience who are in the midst of studying and completing your either bachelor's program or your master's program for those of you who are considering joining the Stetson family. And so we'd like to welcome all of you here this evening. Uh, I'm Dr. Faye Sips, and I'm director of the Executive MBA programs here at the Mercer Stetson School. And it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you tonight one of our graduates of the EMBA program in 2009, uh, David Leon. David has enjoyed a tremendous amount of success since he graduated from Stetson. I'm going to ask him to tell you a bit about his story and his journey. He is currently the Senior Vice President of Manufacturing and Quality for Bluebird. And he, this uh, you may not know, is that those school bus people are actually the second largest automotive industry employer um, in the state of Georgia. And he is going to be talking with you about the contributions of his industry and the firm and why manufacturing matters and why you as MBAs in particular should be very interesting to, interested in his things. He has over 14 years of experience in manufacturing and he works in both domestic as well as global transit marketing. He has worked in operations, quality, materials, logistics, and he has a uh, leading a team of almost 1,250 as they manufacture school buses for students around the world. And with that said, I'd like to introduce you to Dave Green. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Uh, again, thank you. Uh, it's my, my privilege and my honor to be here tonight to be able to talk to, uh, to this group of people, especially uh, I see some of my old professors in here. So it's uh, quite an honor that uh, uh, I'm pretty excited to be able to come here and talk tonight. Um, again, I am, uh, my name is Dave Whalen. I am the Senior Vice President of uh, Operations for uh, Bluebird Corporation. Um, I'll give you a little uh, background on what Bluebird does here in a minute, uh, but uh, Dr. Sis asked me just to talk a little bit about uh, uh, where and what has happened since I, I was in the MBA program uh, back in 2009. When I started the program, I was Director of uh, Operations for our, one of our facilities. At that time, uh, I had an opportunity to be uh, promoted to Vice President of Operations. And just uh, recently here, I was uh, promoted to Senior Vice President. So, you know, I think as you guys are sitting here, and, and sometimes it's tough when you're sitting in class time or, you know, think about, is this going to actually do anything for me? Is, is this important? Uh, you know, as, as business people and, and people part of companies, you know, the things that you learn here are, are very applicable to uh, what, what, uh, what you guys need to do. You know, I, for me, uh, you know, in 07, we were actually purchased by a private equity firm. So, uh, you know, some of the financial things and some of the, the, the things that were taught in this program, they helped me with my new employers to show that I do have a, a you know, a financial acumen and, and those type of things are very important. You know, not just from that standpoint, but as we make business decisions, you know, the, the things that you're learning here in this program are going to help you make better business decisions. And by making good decisions, it's going to give you the opportunity to succeed in, in, in the business place. And as you succeed, your companies succeed, you know, good things happen to you. And so, you know, that's really why you're here today. And, and I just want to encourage you that uh, you are making the right choice. Uh, Mercer has been a, a great addition uh, to, to, to my resume, and I'm proud of it. And I'm proud to be an alum of Mercer University. So with that... Uh, I'll get into my topic. Um, again, uh, when, when Dr. Sis asked me to talk, uh, you know, I spent a little bit of time trying to think about uh, what I would like to discuss, and I think for me, it just came pretty natural. Uh, you know, I've been in manufacturing for a long time. It definitely is a passion of mine. You know, what do they say? If you do something you love, you'll never work a day in your life. So uh, it really is that way for me. I, I am pretty passionate about this topic. 
it is very important to, to us as, as a country, and so you know, hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll touch on some of those things on why I think manufacturing matters. But again, you know, I, I guess I'm a little biased, uh, so you know, I wanted to go back and see if I could find any, uh, any other important people in time uh, that uh, shared uh, some of my beliefs about how important manufacturing is, as you can see. From this quote, uh, you know, one of our founding fathers, uh, you know, the belief was that manufacturing was a cornerstone to what makes this country great, and it is something that we need to protect. So as you can see, agriculture, manufacturing, commerce, navigation, they are the four pillars of our, of our, of our economy. And so, you know, as a country, we need to look back to what, uh, what this wise man had said and, and, and think about where is manufacturing, what's going on with manufacturing in the United States. And, and so I hopefully I'll touch on some of those points tonight. But one thing I wanted to do is one thing you should always try to do is understand who your audience is. So, uh, you know, so I wanted to go out and see, you know, there's a lot of people that go get MBAs. And so I, I know when I was in the MBA program, I was a little bit of a unique person because I think uh, we had a class uh, of about 30 people and I think there was only about two of us that were actually in manufacturing. So I was, I was a little curious if that was the common trend. So as you can see, you know, from an from a MBA standpoint, there's very few of us from manufacturing that actually, uh, you know, are, are out there. So, uh, you know, so I thought this was a great opportunity for me to talk about something that I really like to people that may or may not understand how important this was. So I, I think this, to me, it was just I wanted to understand. So I think, uh, you know, I think that's probably going to be pretty common here, uh, the breakdown in here. I don't know how many people are in manufacturing out here tonight, but, uh, you know, we did have a lot of people from the uh, retail and financial industries, Home Depot, Coke, that type of stuff was well represented in our class. So, But uh, I just want to give a little history about Bluebird to understand where, what we are and, 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 uh, and what we do and, and, and how we fit into this equation of manufacturing and, and why it matters. For those of you who don't know, uh, Bluebird is a, is a Georgia company. Uh, it is uh, located in Fort Valley, Georgia. Uh, probably some of you don't know where Fort Valley, Georgia is. It's, Oh, good. Uh, Fort Valley, is, uh, it's, it's just outside of Macon, Georgia, so it's about an hour and a half, two hours from here. Uh, when I was going through your program, I, I drove up, uh, you know, tw every other weekend uh, from, from there. So, uh, but uh, we uh, do, uh, all of our manufacturing is centralized in the, uh, in the uh, Fort Valley area. Thank you. Uh, our main facility in Fort Valley is, is about 870,000 square feet of manufacturing facility. Uh, we do have uh, 1,100 hourly associates and uh, 250 salaried employees at that location. Uh, and the capacity of, uh, of our facility right now is, is approximately about 15,000 units. So, so as you see all those school buses uh, uh, driving around, uh, I'm sure you see a lot of them up here in Atlanta. Uh, about a third of the, of the, of the country's uh, vehicles are produced in Fort Valley, Georgia. So. Uh, we also do uh, have a uh, fabrication facility. Uh, you know, uh, about three years ago, um, we looked at what our, our manufacturing footprint was, and, and you know, as most manufacturers did in the in the late '90s, early 2000s, we did a lot of outsourcing, uh, kind of uh, divested of of some of that technology. And but it became very clear to us with with our manufacturing footprint and with our product mix. Uh, we're pretty highly customized and, and uh, very, very complex manufacturing. So what happens is we have a lot of small run sizes of parts. So uh, ha having that done on the outside isn't necessarily the most cost efficient. So w we did an analysis and it came pretty clear to us that bringing back in some of that uh, manufacturing into our own, uh, uh, our own facility was, was going to put us at a pretty good competitive advantage. So we invested in uh, uh, an older uh, facility. Uh, it was actually a textile facility that had been uh, lost all the business uh, for various reasons. So uh, we, we, we found a pretty good building. And uh, so what we ended up doing was uh, buying a bunch of equipment. And uh, we started a, a fabrication facility. So in this facility, uh, we, we can do uh, anything from uh, laser cutting, plasma cutting, turrets, welding, robotic welding, uh, all, the, all the stuff you would, you would, you would uh, think of when you think of a, a, a 
fabrication facility. Again, that facility has about 150 employees. Uh, another facility, this is actually uh, about three, four years ago, and, I'll and this kind of fits into some of the things I'll talk about a little bit. It became very clear to us that uh, uh, we had another portion of our business, and that would be our type A buses, which are the little buses. Uh, um, it's, a, it's a pretty competitive uh, uh, market. Uh, there was quite a few players in that market, and it was very clear that uh, to, to compete, there had to be some consolidation in that marketplace. So uh, as, of, uh, as you can see, 2009, it became very clear to us that as, as a company, if we wanted to stay in this business, we had to do something about that. So we approached uh, one of our biggest competitors, and we started down a plan of, of working on a consolidation. And as you can see, in 2009, we consummated a 50-50 joint venture uh, with uh, Microbird or with GR Dan, uh, and formed a new company called Microbird by GR Dan. And so, basically, what we were doing is uh, it was becoming too costly for us both to keep two products, two engineering teams, that type of stuff. So we had to we had to take a hard look at our operations, and we, we definitely saw this as an opportunity. It's been a a very good uh, move for us. Uh, GR Dan is, uh, the Microbird is one of the renowned products in the, in the, in the uh, industry. But as you can see there, we have 101,000 square feet of uh, manufacturing uh, uh, space in Drummondville, uh, uh, Quebec. And that employs about 200 employees with a production cap capacity of about 3,000 units. So we're producing all these buses. Uh, uh, you know, and so one of the things we need to do is be able to support our product in the field. Uh, uh, you know, one of the things that we push quite a bit uh, is that, uh, you know, after the initial acquisition, you know, we push for quite a few dollars per, per VIN number that we get in the field. So it's somewhat of an annuity for you. So for us, you know, when we look at our business model, parts are a very important portion of that because it's a, it's a recurring revenue stream for us. So we wanted to make sure that we were prepared to, to service the marketplace. Uh, so uh, we, we built a 200,000 square foot warehouse in Delaware, Ohio. Uh, why Delaware, Ohio? It's kind of centrally located actually in the central time zone. Uh, there's actually a lot of trucking that comes through there. So we were able to leverage uh, some trucking lanes where people were deadheaded coming into there uh, with, with trucks. So we get cheaper uh, logistics costs. But uh, as you can see here, uh, we do uh, pretty much say that uh, we can get you any part uh, that we've built from 1927 to current. Uh, the ones on the 1927 might take us a little bit longer. We don't actually stock them, but uh, as you can see, uh, that team there, uh, they, they manage over 100,000 SKUs or 100,000 part numbers. So uh, they, have a, they have a big job and, and it takes a lot, of, uh, a lot of planning, a lot of logistics to make that happen. But uh, it's definitely one of our one of our key uh, parts of our business, and uh, it, it's uh, critical for our success. As Dr. Sisk said, uh, you know, when I, 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 this was actually published by, as you can see here, down by the Georgia Power Community. Um, you know, when you think of Georgia and you think of automotive manufacturers, you know, most people probably don't think of Bluebird. Uh, you know, and uh, the top one there, uh, you know, that was pretty popular a couple of years ago. The state did a lot to get Kia to come in here and generate jobs. Uh, you know, uh, as you can see, Bluebird, we've been here for 85 years uh, producing in the state of Georgia. So uh, we're pretty proud that uh, we are a significant part of the manufacturing community and, and economic community here in the state of Georgia. And again, we've been in the business for 85 years. One of the things we proud our, pride ourselves on is, is we, 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 we have been the first in a lot of things. Uh, so, you know, we do lead the industry in safety, reliability, and innovation. And uh, I'll talk about why those things are important here in a little bit. But as you can see, uh, you know, we were the first uh, compressed natural gas school bus, the first propane school bus. Those are all alternative fuels uh, that we use. We're the first electric school buses. Uh, some of you might have seen those. Those were actually produced on a grant uh, for the uh, Atlanta, Atlanta Olympics by the Georgia, uh, Georgia Power. Uh, we worked in conjunction with them. Actually, some of those are still on the road uh, in California. They, they took on a second life, and, uh, but, uh, um, but uh, 
So way back in 94, we actually produced an all-electric vehicle. We currently don't have it in our lineup because it's not uh, economically feasible uh, technology as far as we're concerned. We believe there's other green technologies that are a lot more cost effective uh, for the marketplace. But someday, uh, as you know, as technology and cost and that come down, it's something that we, we continually look at. But as you can see, uh, you know, for 85 years, we're continually trying to change, trying to innovate, and, and I think that's an important thing that I'll talk about here in a minute. So, so uh, again, I, I got to be a little careful with the, with the first quote that I have here. As, as I told you, I work for a private equity firm uh, that owns our company, but, uh, you know, a business that makes nothing but money is a poor business. You know, that was Henry Ford, you know. Uh, I think most of us have heard of Henry Ford, and he was a pretty a prominent manufacturer. You know, and so, uh, again, I, I found another quote from him, uh, chop your own wood and it'll warm you twice. So I think when, when I think about manufacturing, one of the things that people got to keep in mind is, is that not all jobs are created the same. And so when you look at manufacturing jobs, it's more than just the job that actually produces it. So when you think about an assembly line worker or, or a person that's working on the line, that's just one job. But then there's the job of the person that had to manufacture the part for that assembly worker to put it on. The job of the person that had to produce the raw material for that. The person that had to drive the truck. So as you can see, one of the big things about manufacturing jobs, there's definitely a multiplier of, of, of jobs. So for each job that you have in manufacturing, there are several support jobs that have to be uh, produced to, to be able to support that manufacturing job. And so I'll talk about that in a minute. So with that, you would think, you would think that uh, as, a, as a country and as, as an economy, we'd be wanting to grow manufacturing jobs. So what, what, what's been going on in the manufacturing community? So as you can see, since the 70s, uh, manufacturing actually as a percent of GDP, uh, and I'm, I'm sure if you've been in your, uh, your program uh, long enough, you'll get to, you'll get to love uh, data and the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Bureau of Economic uh, uh, Analysis. So there's all kinds of data out there. So, you know, uh, as my professor back there, Dr. Tuttero, said, uh, you know, don't just look for manna from heaven. You need to be able to go and find this stuff yourself. <laughs> so I went and found this stuff myself. And uh, so as you can see, manufacturing is in continued decline. And so, you know, you, when you think about that, it's declining. So it's not just one job that's declining. There's actual several, several support jobs that are declining. So as you can imagine, uh, as you look at manufacturing jobs, they're declining. What are they being replaced with here in the country? They're actually being replaced pro predominantly with service jobs. So as you can see over time, uh, the, the, the rise in service jobs has, has continued to grow as manufacturing jobs have, have declined. So, uh, you know, some of this is, you know, uh, technology, some of it's that, but, you know, others is, is just our, 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 our ability to compete in manufacturing in the United States. So, again, as I said, manufacturing is a GDP engine. So. You can kind of see the graphic there on the side. Uh, for each dollar and for each person that comes into a manufacturing facility, it generates multiple dollars of GDP and multiple jobs. And so when I was, went out looking, uh, the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, some other, some other uh, people have done quite a few studies on this, and we actually commissioned a study ourselves to understand what we, how we impact uh, the Georgia economy, and I'll talk about that in a second. But for a manufacturing jobs on an employment multiplier standpoint, it can range anywhere from five to 15 to one. So for each manufacturing job, it either generates five to 15, and, and 15 is on some of the more high tech and some of the, some of the upper, upper manufacturing jobs. You know, 5% would probably be down closer as I'll talk about in a second on, on the Bluebird. But as you can see, like I said, that one job has a huge effect. So in addition to that, so as you can imagine, since it has a big effect on employment, it also has a big effect on, on the GDP multiplier. So depending on industry, again, uh, the estimates are that uh, a manufacturing job generates two to 10 to one ratio of GDP. So uh, as you look at our GDP, our gross domestic product here in the country, for each job, 
You know, if you go into the, to the data, you will see service, retail, all those things. It takes manufacturing, it takes product to support those industries. And so, as you can see, the, the multiplier on the GDP can be pretty significant. In stark contrast, if you remember, I, I showed, the, showed the graphic there a second ago. Our service jobs are growing, but when you look at the multiplier, uh, for the most part, it looked to be about a one-to-one -one ratio. Some industries, it was a little bit under one. But uh, so we're replacing manufacturing jobs with jobs that don't have that multiplier effect. And so, uh, so as you can see, as, as my last point says there, you know, as trends, so from the trends I showed you earlier, as we lose these jobs, it can have a huge impact on our GDP and our employment. And so to me, that's one big reason why I think manufacturing matters and why it should matter to us as a country is, is that you know, it, it is a source of, of great employment and, and great uh, generator of GDP. So one of the things I wanted to understand was, you know, so we're, we're replacing manufacturing jobs with service jobs. And I apologize if it's a little tough to see, but um, you know, some estimates when I, when I was out looking for this, it estimates that uh, about 50% of manufacturing salaries flow back into GDP as consumer spending. So why, why is that important? Uh, for those of you who don't know, about 68.5% of our GDP is generated off in consumer spending. So it's a big deal to, to know, understand how much disposable income people have. So as you can see, I, I boxed out a couple of important things here. So like I said, the, the, the jobs that you have up here are, 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 are more in line with some of the higher skilled, higher trades actually require secondary education and, and that type of things. But as, as a country, when you get down here in this general, general area from transportation down, this, is actually, this would be considered lower, you know, uh, lower tech jobs or, or a high school degree or you know, blue collar jobs, I guess some people would call them. But, uh, but as you can see, manufacturing is, is, is close to the top, again, from uh, the BLS data. And that generates about $47,000 salary. As you can see, as we replace those with, with uh, more service-related jobs, you can see a pretty significant impact on people's salaries. And so um, as people are out there spending money, as we, as we replace these jobs with uh, the manufacturing jobs with, with uh, lower uh, salary jobs, as you can see, it's going to have a huge impact on what people can spend. And so, uh, you know, every day we hear people talking about the, you know, the consumer confidence indexes and those type of things. You know, that's, that's directly driven by what people have the ability to spend. And so I think as we look at, you know, as a country and, and you know, uh, I, I, I spent a lot of time not trying to get too political in these slides, but, you know, you do hear, you hear daily about the shrinking middle class. I mean, that, that is directly driven by, by this effect right here. Is, this is what's driving our middle class to, to shrink is, is the type of jobs that we have for our, our, our people to, uh, to, to do every day. So what about Bluebird? Uh, we actually uh, spent some money to understand what our impact on the Georgia economy was uh, for, for some various reasons. We actually lobbied to get some legislation in place to help the state understand uh, when, uh, when they're making bus purchases inside of the state of Georgia uh, that they should consider the overall economic impact of that purchase if, if they're buying local content. Uh, I don't, a lot of you have probably seen, uh, you know, bumper stickers, buy local, that type of stuff. You know, we're no different. Uh, we want people to buy local here in the state of Georgia. So, uh, but as you can see, uh, our estimates that, uh, you know, on a Georgia payroll and Georgia sourced material, uh, Bluebird spends about $21,000 per bus. Uh, our estimates when we went and looked at it, so about every dollar that's spent on Bluebird in the state of Georgia equates to four dollars of revenue for the state of Georgia. Uh, so when you factor that in, each bus that uh, they buy from us here in, in the state generates about $86,000 of GDP. Uh, I have a whole bunch of other slides that I cut out of here, but I, I left the last bullet point on here. This is usually when, I'm, when we're speaking to constituents here in the state of Georgia. Uh, and in fact, it's, uh, 
it's hard for me to travel around the city of Atlanta because uh, our market penetration here in Atlanta is, is, is not very good. Uh, outside of the state, uh, we seem to do better, but currently only a third of buses are produced in the state of Georgia that are driven in the state of Georgia. We're working very hard with that. We have a, a partner uh, called Yancey uh, uh, that uh, is a pretty prominent uh, a cat dealer here in the state. Uh, we've been working with them. Uh, we're, we're turning the tide, and, but I guess, uh, you know, as my political pitch is, as you're looking around, uh, maybe we have some people that are on boards and that, uh, school boards, just keep that in mind. It, you know, this isn't just us. Uh, you know, we work with other local uh, labor and manufacturing groups. This is anything. So, you know, it really does matter if you're purchasing local products. So, Again, that's why I believe manufacturing matters. So, you know, I, I, so the next thing I want to talk about is, you know, what, you know, what else? Why else would manufacturing matter? So we understand that it's a creator of jobs. It drives, it drives our GDP. But, you know, the other thing that we got to understand is innovation comes from manufacturing, either through manufacturers innovating or them producing the innovations that people come up with. So I went out and looked for some quotes uh, here. You know, I, I thought this first one was, 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 was spot on. You know, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said they wanted faster horses. So you know, I, when I hear that, you know, I think of Steve Jobs. You know, how, how many of us knew we needed an iPod, an iPad? You know, the, some of the things that, that he created, he created markets. And so that's what manufacturing can do. They can create markets that didn't even exist. They can create revenue, GDP, jobs that weren't even there 10 years ago. So, I mean, you know, as technology is growing and, and, and that, it's manufacturing that's right there with, with the innovators uh, that drive that. You know, and again, uh, you know, Ford, they, they basically called him nuts for wanting to be able to do something. And, you know, his comment to that was produce it anyways. So, and Deming, for those of you who don't know who Deming is, he's a pretty prominent quality person. Uh, basically helped the Japanese kick our, our butts here in the early uh, 70s and 80s. Uh, but uh, he, was a, he was a statistician that really, he went into uh, Japan after, uh, after the war and, and really helped them rebuild their manufacturing uh, infrastructure. And, you know, I, I, I struggle with this one a little bit because uh, I don't want to, you know, customers are important, but, you know, when I really do think about it, innovation, you know, for the most part, you know, it, it, a lot of it does come from the producer. You know, we are always striving to, to improve, to, to, to understand what our customers want before they know they want it. So uh, it is a, is, a, is a big thing uh, for manufacturers. You know, that's why most, uh, uh, most uh, companies have research, most companies have marketing departments, they want to understand where that market is before, before other people do because that's how you get in and, 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 and get into a market before anybody else and that's where you can make you know, you know, a large sum of money. So. But uh, again, uh, you know, uh, for those of you that may be not familiar with this term, but it's a pretty uh, prominent uh, uh, nomenclature in, in a manufacturing, but you know, there is a product life cycle. Uh, so, um, you know, I think as you look at this, so, you know, in step one, everybody's always planning, innovating, specifying. Uh, then you define and you develop and validate. But again, if I look at number three, all products, all product ideas need to be produced to become a reality. So, you know, as you're thinking about some of these things that uh, you've purchased, you've, you know, some of these new ideas, keep in mind that there's someone like me that produces school buses that produce that product out there that, uh, that you're using. And so, you know, I think it's important for us to understand that it is manufacturing that brings us these new technologies, these new innovations. It has to be manufactured. And so it's a very important part of the, of the development and the innovation process is, is manufacturing because, you know, for most part, a lot of this new technology actually drives innovation in the manufacturing processes. And I'll talk about that in a minute on why that's important. So just kind of, you know, kind of frame this up, you know, uh, again, we've been in the business for 85 years and, and you know, I, I would, as I'm sure some of you don't think that the school bus was an innovation, but, you know, you got to think about some of the things that were going on 85 years ago uh, prior to, uh, prior to uh, uh, Bluebird uh, beginning uh, business. You know, school age enrollment was growing rapidly. 
uh, child transportation, we basically had no standards. Uh, and so rural and suburban populations had limited access. So when you think about that, people had limited access to education. That would be almost unheard of these days. So, but when you think about that, there was times that people did not have easy access to education. Uh, and, 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 and in metropolitan areas, you know, as you went around the areas of schools, it resulted in high congestion. So, you know, these are problems that were, were there 85 years ago, and, and frankly, some of them are still here today. So, you know, as, as a, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, we, we have some pretty common statistics about, you know, why school buses and why manufacturing school buses are important. As you can see, one school bus is estimated to keep about 36 cars off the road. So, um, so when you think about that, about 480,000 buses daily are making runs out in the, in the country moving students. So that means 17, 17 million trips are eliminated just by school buses. So why is that important? So as you can see, it has a pretty huge multiplying effect. So as you can see, those school buses deliver about eight billion in fuel savings. Uh, so, you know, when you want to think about green technologies, and, and, I, and I mentioned this a little bit about the, the electric bus, uh, you know, currently the electric bus uh, would, uh, we've looked at has a price point that some of our competition has it is right around $250,000. A regular school bus is about $80,000. You can't afford, you can't get the return on the 250,000 uh, compared to that. But when you think about it, if you truly are looking at technology that's going to help the environment right now, even a diesel school bus is, is actually a, a green product. Uh, as you can see, we pride ourselves on being able to, to definitely deliver something that, that adds value and, and, and uh, uh, eliminates energy waste and, and those type of things. So, you know, it, again, this was driven by us seeing a need in the marketplace to be able to transport, transport students. So, again, one of the things we really do pride ourselves on, and I don't think most people know about this, uh, because one of the most common questions I get is how come school buses don't have seat belts? But, uh, you know, school buses really are the safest mode of transportation. So when you look at the deaths that occur in, in, uh, in school buses or getting students to school, you are far safer to put your kid on a school bus than any other form of transportation, even in your car with you. Uh, and, and one of the main reasons for that is, is again, as I, as I talked about innovation and, and those type of things, we design a school bus to protect a student. We have a very specific reason for doing that. And, for those of you who don't know, there's a real reason why school buses are so high because cars are lower than them. So if you're in a crash, they have a tendency to go under it. So there's a lot of innovation, a lot of engineering that goes into that. And so, you know, it really is purpose-built design for, for doing that very specific task. And we're pretty proud of what that does. So with all that, you know, why am I bringing up something that we've been working on for 85 years? Um, uh, I don't know if anybody follows any of the news, but we've actually popped up in some press releases. Uh, we're, we are pretty active in the Chinese market right now, uh, looking at what we can do there. Um, and if I went back to this slide right here, this is China today on a lot larger scale. Currently, our estimates are that there are about 200 million school-age students in China right now, and 90 million of them need transportation. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen some of the press releases. They've been pretty popular. Uh, th they've had some significant accidents uh, where uh, they would have 50, 60 kids on what we would consider a 15-passenger van and those type of things. So they're really struggling with some of the same things that uh, we, we dealt with 85 years ago. <laughs> So here again, we believe we have some innovation for the Chinese market, and so we're, we're pretty active in, in that. And so I know some of the EMBAs might even have an opportunity to visit China. I, I had an opportunity to go when, when I was in the program. It's an eye-opening experience. It's a, uh, it's a, it is a market like no other. So, but we believe we have solutions. So here again, it, it's manufacturing that can deliver those type of solutions that are going to help an economy. So.
So, uh, you know, so manufacturing is in decline. And, and so, you know, I think uh, you know, as a manufacturer, we've got to continually look at, uh, you know, why is that happening and what can we do about it? And so, you know, I went out, you know, again, you know, our products are what sell. And so as, as, we, as we have good products, we have good word of mouth, as you can see here from this first quote, that's what actually drives value. And, and, and again, you know, as manufacturers, you know, we have a tendency to be slow to change. Uh, but, you know, we need to go find waste, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that, you know. But eliminating waste is, you know, what's going to make us more competitive. So, you know, what can we do uh, as manufacturers to compete in, in, the, in the global marketplace? Because, you know, for, for many people, when they hear the word China, they hear the word India, they, they think of low quality. That is not the case. They are, they are formidable competitors. They, have, they produce very high quality products. Um, and, and so one of the things that we as, man, as American manufacturers need to do, we need to make sure that we're continually improving our quality. And so, as I said, you saw a lot of quotes from Deming, you know, it's, we need to make sure that we're validating our designs. We need to make sure that we're putting processes in place that are capable of, of producing repeatable products. Because any of those failures anywhere along there drive costs into our, into our product that, that makes us less competitive. As, as you saw there, and, and hopefully as you saw on the slide from 1927, any company that's stagnant is, is, is never going to succeed. So, you know, as a manufacturer and as, as product uh, uh, companies, we need to make sure that we are continually driving innovation. Uh, you know, we need to be uh, out there looking where we can create markets, where we can improve markets. Uh, and so as we're looking at our products, uh, you know, we need to continually uh, look at what we can do to, to drive innovation. Leverage process technology. So let's be frank. One of the things that uh, low cost countries have on us is, is the cost of labor. And so, uh, you know, as, as we look at technology as robotics, as those type of things come down in cost, they really can make American manufacturers competitive again. And so, uh, you know, there's always going to be cases where, where, where you have labor intensive products. Uh, that uh, it is it's going to be difficult to compete, but there there definitely is manufacturing jobs that that, that can be created here, and uh, and that kind of ties with the last point that I'll get to here in a minute. But you know, as manufacturers, above all else, we need to control our costs. You know, as as we looked at our footprint, uh, as as I discussed, you know, we've had some tough decisions to make. Uh, you know, we uh, we had to uh, we had to close the facility in, in, in up around the Chattanooga area. We consolidated manufacturing into our Fort Valley location, uh, made some capital improvements to that facility so that we could get the same capacity out of one facility that we were getting to, out of two facilities. But you know, those are the type of things as manufacturers we need to be looking at where we can control cost. It's looking at uh, you know, design for assembly, design for manufacturing, those type of things where we can go in and look at where we've got waste in our product. You know, uh, 5S, lean, uh, some, some buzzwords that you guys may hear. You know, it's continually looking inside of your processes, inside of your companies. Uh, you know, it isn't just on the manufacturing floor. It's in the accounting office. It's in the sales office. It's, you know, where can we find technology? Where can we find ways to trim costs? What, what actually, uh, for, for those of you that have any lean, you know, where is the value stream in actually creating that product? If it doesn't create value, you need to get it out of there because it's making you less competitive. So as American manufacturers, that's definitely something uh, that uh, we, we need to take a hard look at. And, and you know, as, as you hear about some of the things that, uh, some of the tough things that the auto industry had to do, you know, uh, they actually had to go after some of these. They were closing plants, consolidating operations. So, you know, it is, it is key for American manufacturers to go out and find that waste. And then, you know, uh, reshoring production. Um, you know, I'm sure some of you have heard the term offshoring, outsourcing, you know, offshoring. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this is a, a, re, a, re, uh, you know, a reinvigoration of uh, American manufacturing. So, you know, as, as manufacturers, and one of the things that you guys will do as, as MBA students, you know, it, it's making sure you're looking at the total cost. You know, sometimes it's easy for us to go and get blinded by some of, some of the cheaper labor costs. 
But you know, with anything, there's usually offsets. So as, as you started to look at uh, potentially offshoring products, you know, where, where us as American manufacturing companies typically fall short is you, you've introduced huge supply chains. So there's carrying costs, there's inventory costs, there's you know, change costs. So when you think you have 90, 120 days of product in, 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 in any supply chain, just imagine if you had a designer or a manufacturing issue you have huge amounts of supply chain that you have. So, you know, one of the things as, as manufacturers, again, like I said, there's, there's, always, there's always a place for, for this type of stuff. But as manufacturers, we need to make sure we're looking at what the cost structure is, what the real cost is. And, and I, I will argue that there are probably cases where it does make sense to bring it back here because of, of, of the actual total cost model that you would be looking at. So, you know, to me, in conclusion, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing matters uh, to me, one, because that's what I do every day. Uh, but, you know, two, it, it really is an important driver of our economy. Uh, you know, uh, and as I talked, I, I truly believe, you know, trends in manufacturing seem to be negative. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think they can be reversed. And I think, you know, as we, as a country, as we look at what we can do, you know, that's a whole, whole other speaker series for, for another night to get in on the political side. There are, there are a lot of things we can do as a country to make sure that we turn those trends around. And, you know, as, as you hear these things, I hope you'll think of some of these things tonight and, and some of the things I talked about on, on why I believe it is, is key to uh, our success. And, and, and as, I, as I stated earlier, uh, you know, as manufacturers, you know, a lot of this is in our own control. You know, we've got to be innovating. We've got to be coming out with new products. We've got to be coming out with new designs, new manufacturing processes, new distribution channels, new markets. And, and so I think as manufacturers, as, as we continue to generate and, 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 and get to innovation, you know, I, I think that's one of the keys for us uh, to come back and, and, and build, our, build the manufacturing in the United States. So with that, So you know, one thing I didn't I didn't talk about you know, uh, I, I one of my one of my beliefs is domestically produced for domestic consumption, and so you know, as we go after the China market, as we're as we're as we're looking at getting it off the ground floor, there's probably going to make some sense that you know there's things that we do actually by exporting units to China for a while, uh, potentially putting uh, kits together that we'll send that are the next step to that to, to, to help them get up and going. But, you know, when you, when you think about uh, currently the, the domestic school bus market is right around 25 to 30,000 units, uh, we believe that the, the Chinese market is going to be anywhere from 100 to 120,000 units a year. Uh, so, uh, you know, five times the size of this, uh, y you have to be in-country producing. And so, Really, what we're doing is looking for domestic partners and, 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 and that. So, so, but again, uh, you know, that, that for us, we believe that helps make us a, a more profitable country. We will need school buses here in, in the States. And so, as we are a stronger and, and, and more resilient company, uh, that helps us out. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the school bus business is pretty cyclical. Uh, as you can imagine, as schools close, this is our busy time of the year. Everybody wants their buses during this time of the year. So as you get into the October, November, December time frame, you know, we, we kind of we kind of wane off. And so finding markets that can fill that gap in and, and help us be more competitive, more, you know, as as we're competitive in China, it's going to change our cross structure here in the States. And so that'll make us more competitive here in the States. And so, you know, it really is interlinked. So that was a great question. Uh, 
we have, uh, in fact, Bluebird as a company, we have a history of being in other industries. We actually were in, in the transit industry, which is a very competitive and pretty interesting market. Uh, we also were in motor coaches and some of those type of things. Um, we, really, we really looked at ourselves and, and uh, we decided that the, the cost of being in those markets was, was pretty costly for us. So we really have uh, consolidated and we, we truly are pretty focused on being a school bus manufacturer. And it's actually one of the things we use against our competition. Uh, on one of the slides, if you looked at it, it says we're the only purpose-built school bus company. Uh, we like to poke at our competitors. Uh, you know, as we build a chassis, all we build chassis for are school buses. And so, as you can imagine, we, we, we set our, our springs, our, our ride quality, and that all that stuff based on school buses. Uh, our two competitors actually build over-the-road trucks. So the same thing that you see pulling a semi is the same thing they put your kids on every day. And so we, we have a tendency to say that we, we build it and we can design it better. And so we actually use that as, as a differentiator for us in the marketplace that, that we are a purpose-built school bus company. And so not to say that there isn't a market that went open up someplace, uh, but uh, you know, right now we're, we're pretty focused on the school bus market. So as you know, I like to ask marketing and uh, questions. So the uh, recent um, um, accident among six school buses, I can't remember which county it was in, but did that create a PR problem or a um, PR coup, so to speak? Uh, because I think it protected the children. Mm -hmm. But anyways, I'll, I'll leave it to you. How, how do you guys kind of deal with that? Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we take very seriously any any accident. Uh, you know, it is it is negative press for us at the time, but I think you touched on a, on a, on a great point. Uh, um, every time you do hear one of those stories, uh, you usually don't hear the word fatality associated with it. So uh, for us, you know, we, we, try to, you know, we try to work with uh, the people that are affected. And so, you know, we are typically will we'll, we'll get with the district or the school uh, district that's been impacted, make sure we're supporting them. So we do try to turn it into it. Uh, it is always a, a difficult situation um, because uh, uh, it is, uh, you know, it is a very emotional event. Uh, you know, we, we, you know we, we pride ourselves on saying that we, we transport one of the most precious cargo every day. And so it is a very emotional event uh, for, for, a, for a parent to go through to understand that their kids have been in an accident. But I, hopefully they see that, uh, you know, as, as you look at that, that, you know, typically if you hear some major wrecks like that that are with teen drivers, you usually don't see the outcome coming out the same. So we, we, try, to, we try to promote the positive about our products and, and, and that. So it's a fine line you've got to walk about uh, trying to capitalize on that incident. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think what we try to do is, is educate. You know, after that, uh, you know, we try to do some education programs in the schools, that type of thing, to let them know, you know, not necessarily so much about that incident in and of itself, but, you know, here's why school buses, here's why your districts use them. And so we kind of try and weave that in there as, as we, we go through those events. So. Oh, there's a... From the uh, operations standpoint, since we're talking about cost control, um, how has Bluebird been affected by unions and uh, how do you guys deal with this situation? Uh, Bluebird is a non-union facility. Uh, Georgia, for those of you who don't know, is a, is a right-to-work state. Uh, what that means is, is that uh, as an employee, even if there is a union, you don't have to participate in the union. Um, uh, I believe unions have a place. Uh, you know, so I, this is a very delicate question for any manufacturing <laughs> guy. Uh, um, but, you know, I think... Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think it can go without recognition. There's a reason why you've seen a resurgence in southern manufacturing, um, and that is directly associated with right-to-work states, and, and that's because there is, with anything, you know, a, a, a union can't be successful without the company either. And so, 
You know, I think as you guys maybe saw some of the things unfold in the, in the big three, you know, there had to be concessions, and those concessions, let's be clear, they're not fun to go through. They're very difficult. They're very emotional things to have to go through, but for the health of the company, you have to do it. So uh, sometimes the union is an impediment to, to being able for companies to be able to do that. Uh, but on the same token, um, usually where you'll find unions is in companies that are not treating their workforces right. So I think as a manufacturer, you know, you, you give respect, you treat your associates the way that you, they need to be treated, you make sure you're giving them living wages, you make sure you're giving them good benefits, that type of things. And it usually takes care of itself. Um, I've worked in both union and non-union facilities, great people in both of them. Um, you know, it really is a, a decision of the workforce on what they need to do. Uh, you know, from a manufacturing standpoint, I would always say it's easier to work in a non-union environment just, just from a from a change standpoint, but uh, you know they've been around for a long time. Uh, my dad was actually a union member, so uh, <laughs> it's. Uh... So you really pushed me to get political tonight. So, uh, uh, you, 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 I mean, at, at, I will say probably one of the biggest challenges that we face as a manufacturing is, is finding educated workforce. It, it really, you know, you, you know, when you think about it, you know, when I went through school, I took shop classes. I, I did those type of things. Trade schools were pretty you know, prominent and those type of things. So, you know, I think as you look at manufacturing, you know, the, the, a skilled workforce, you know, unfortunately, college isn't for everybody. And, and you know, I think we went through a, a portion of, this, in, of time where that was really, you had schools that really focused on that track. So uh, we, we've had some conversations with some, some, some other school boards. And, you know, there, there is a need for, for trade-minded uh, type, type activities. You know, I... I one of the things I did all through high school is I took drafting classes because I knew I wanted to be an engineer. Well, you know, that was probably considered more of a, a trade that, uh, that, that I was going to go and become a, a drafter at some point, but that wasn't what it was about. But it, it's putting that type of skill set into the manufacturing workforce. And, and one of the things that, I, you know, as a, as, a, as a company that we struggle with is we, we, we use engineering sources from India. And I will say that our lowest level of engineering source is a master's and there's quite a few PhDs that actually do engineering work for us. We couldn't afford that here. So, you know, I think as, as, we, as we as a country, we need to make sure that we're, we're building that workforce and that skill sets that are around manufacturing. Um, so, you know, as, as, as you look at your, you know, uh, you know, again, not to be political, I mean, uh, to me, that's why it was a huge deal on some of the things that were happening here in the Atlanta school, you know, like public schools. That, that, we're, we're shortchanging our students. And, and, and so, you know, I think education is the key. And, and, and just finding a workforce that has the work ethic, you know, they're, you know I, I guess I'm, I'll, I'll bow down and, or I'll hide my face a little bit because I'm, a, I'm a, a, a project X or an X generation or whatever it is. I'm right on the cusp of it, but I'm associated with those people. But it, there really is a difference. You know, it was very common for people to wake up, go to work, and you know, that, that type of thing was, you know, I, I get my reward from a paycheck and promotion and that type of thing. It's, it's, there's a lot of other things that, that come into, to, to, uh, you know, with the workforce today. And so as manufacturers, we need to make sure we're, we're, we're working on that. But, you know, as, as you look at economic development, you know, uh, I actually live in Chattanooga, uh, and one of the biggest things that drove a, a VW plant for coming in there that just started operations up there was, was the education system, so. Well, I didn't mean to put any political pressure on no? you, but I think, you know, your answer is very valid. You know, the uh, Koreans, for instance, oh. they put billions of dollars in training, I think it was like $40 billion every year just in training of people. 
Well, I, I, I guess you could say maybe that the subtitle of this is not just manufacturing matters, but education matters too. Yeah, so I mean, uh, yeah, if you saw the ads on TV, it's the, it's the math initiative that's going on. You know, look at some of the places where manufacturing is happening, and they're, they're towards the other end. China, India, those are number one and two, and the United States is now 25th in math and science. So. We need to be respectful of everyone's time here. We want to give you a gift. Oh, thank you. To thank you for coming to your alma mater and spending your time with us. And again, it was great. Uh, we thank appreciate you. it very, very much. Love to come back.